Previously on C Block. Beans, 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 beans. Hello and welcome back to the second installment of C Block, the only series where you get to watch me waste hundreds of hours of my life for your entertainment. Then again, I guess it's not really wasted then, now is it? Honestly, if you missed the last video, don't sweat it so much, because we're going to be explaining everything again this video. Anyway, OBS ate the first 40 minutes of footage, and it's just this screen. You can see my mouse moving around and sound happening, but no video, so we're already off to a great start. But it's mostly just me blasting worms with artillery for 30 minutes. As it turns out, I ended the last video a bit prematurely, because there's still a few things I want to sort out before building the real base. And that starts with rubber, which is what I was doing behind the curtain, and involves this ungodly mess of petrochem hell. The ethane and butane we need are byproducts of getting the methane we set up for purple science, which I'm beating myself up over burning off previously because the natural gas liquids I need are in short supply. This is just a stopgap build, so I'm not too concerned about explaining it, but this rubber will be entirely used for making insulated wires, which I can use to make some upgraded electric poles that will be very convenient while building the new base. But there's another thing I'll need them for, and I'll get to that shortly. Now remember when I said I wanted the real base to have trains? Well, one problem is we don't have anything to fuel them with. Well, we've got charcoal, but that's an awful fuel and not really fitting for a real base. So I'm making rocket fuel. But if the previous recipe was any indication, it's not exactly straightforwards either. It starts with making brown algae from saline water, which I can make in a convenient salination plant now, then turning that into sodium carbonate, then that into sodium hydroxide solution, and then turning that into sodium perchlorate, which makes perchloric acid along with hydrochloric acid, and finally that combines with ammonia to create ammonium perchlorate, which can be turned into rocket boosters. <gasps> uh, yep. If you didn't catch the first part of this series, that's the kind of complexity we're dealing with. To be fair, I didn't need to make the sodium solution from sodium carbonate when this much better recipe exists, but actually realizing all the different ways to make the same thing is part of the challenge. Anyway, that'll slowly stockpile fuel, and by the time I actually get to place a single train, I'll probably be able to fuel it. Alright, now the last thing I need to tangle with before we're getting down to business will be modules. And that starts with, uh, fish. This whole thing is horrifically complicated, and even throwing together something barely functional takes a ton of effort. The fish requires me running a massive pipe for nutrient pulp all the way from my bean farms, but to continually make fish, I need to reinsert the fish into the tank. However, since the goal is polluted water and not fish, I need another recipe called fish petting to consume all the excess fish. This is just a taste of the process, and I'm hardly going into the rest like the alien bacteria from red algae and the inoculated petri dishes. Then there's the geode washing plant I had to make just to get extra crystal dust and actually milling the crystal dust. Again, this is just a rough build to get me what I need, and I'm going to save the actual explanation for when I make the actual build, which, spoilers, isn't even happening this video, but after all this I can finally get the polished crystal splinters I need. And then I need to make the actual modules themselves, and they're not easy. Unlike the base game, it isn't kind enough to just let us combine red and green circuits to get a module. No, we need to make the case, the harness, the contact points, and slam them all together. As you probably guessed, the different colored splinters are used in the different speed, efficiency, and productivity modules. This is also what that insulated wire was really for. We can't mass produce them yet, but a small supply of modules is still extremely convenient for eking out some more production out of old builds. However, that's not why I was so desperate for them. I needed modules because they're necessary ingredients in Power Armor Mark II. With this new Power Armor on, I can fit way more exoskeletons and way more personal robots. Considering how much I'm going to be running around, the speed boost will probably make up for the few hours it took to cobble this thing together across the next hundred hours. Also, I'm setting up concrete, because of course I am. Using the explosives I made for the artillery shells, I can also make some blasting charges that can turn landfill back into water, which will be very useful. Now I don't usually do this, but I spend the next 15 minutes setting up an extensive personal logistics configuration. If you've never used this feature before, it's very convenient for longer playthroughs. You can choose any item and set a corresponding value to it, and as long as you're within your RoboPort's logistics network, logistics bots will automatically ensure that that item stays in your inventory. You can also set items that you want logistics bots to get rid of, and C-Block has a ton of garbage that I prefer to be automatically removed from my inventory. You can also set limits for, say, iron plates. If I want to allow a few in my inventory, but not more than 200, and if I put that value in my filters, any amount over that number gets automatically trashed. Letting your Logibots keep you stocked up with buildings, belts, power poles, and inserters is invaluable when you're doing larger builds. But enough about that, let's actually build something. That starts with using our massive supply of landfill to make this run a lot more block and much less C. Thankfully the engineer can carry a square kilometer of dirt in his backpack, no problem. 
With the blasting charges, I don't need to worry about leaving space for offshore pumps anymore, so I can just put this stuff everywhere. Naturally, the best way to escape the spaghetti of my starter base is to simply build a new one somewhere completely different. Basically, we're gonna build a completely new base from the ground up. Remember, we'll need millions of science to beat this mod, so half measures just ain't gonna cut it. Naturally, the most important part is the sludge stack, so that's what I'm rebuilding first. If you forgot, that's just what I've decided to call the massive, complicated build that creates mineral sludge, which is the precursor to making raw ores and pretty much required to make anything in this mod. I played around with some different designs, but I ended up settling with something similar to my old design, except it's two electrolyzers wide now, and that'll give me a lot more room to play around with, because now I can easily fit all the hydro plants to make the purified water I'll need instead of needing to pipe it in from an external plant. It's got some nightmare piping, but I can live with that. The rest is pretty much the same as the old build, except for this rail I've decided to fit through it, because why not? After setting up the filtration plants just like before, this is the mostly finished product. And as you can see, I can easily paste it multiple times. In retrospect, I probably should have used something cheaper than titanium pipes for everything, seeing as I'm short a couple thousand, but it's not like I'll be turning this thing on anytime soon. Now it's only missing one vital ingredient, and I'll get to that soon, but while that builds, I'm going to sort out something else. You didn't think I forgot about the beans, did you? Before moving forwards, I'd like to have a big enough power plant so that I won't need to worry about power as I slowly build up. So it's time to create Bean Power Version 2. Growing bean a friend just takes sand and salt water, and while I still need to get the sand from washing mud, I can get the salt water from the new salination plants, meaning I need much fewer washing plants than before and can support a lot more farms. About this many farms, 84 to be precise, which sure beats the 12 I could with the previous method. You may have noticed that I'm becoming a little obsessed with keeping these things compact, as the adjustable inserters allow me to supply and harvest my farms with only one lane each by using underground belts. About 12 of the farms are needed to supply the rest with seeds, but what remains can be processed into sweet, sweet beans. Keeping with the dimensions, it'll take about this many processing plants, but once we've got that, we can extract the nutrient pulp out of them. There's just something about seeing this stuff at scale that fills me with glee and reminds me of a time when I couldn't just copy and paste stuff and expect it to magically appear. Well, we build all the gas refineries to turn that nutrient pulp into fuel oil, and we're almost there. I'm going to store massive amounts of fuel oil in these storage tanks. You can think of these tanks as a 600 gigajoule battery, which isn't necessary, but if power demand spikes without enough electricity, the farms would slow down and produce less fuel, which in turn would make even less power as the farms grow even slower in a sort of power death spiral. With these, I'll be able to withstand long periods of demand. Also, I've researched steam turbines, which are much more convenient than the old and busted steam engines. I decided to finalize the build by paving it with concrete, only to find out that the concrete is quite ugly. So if for some reason only the mod special concrete bricks look like the regular concrete we all know and love, with both vanilla concretes turning into this. It makes even less sense because the hazard concrete still looks like it does in the base game despite coming from the block concrete. I pave it over with what little of the mod special concrete I have, and instantly it looks much better. It makes me feel like a doofus for having automated the normal concrete. Anyway, that's 720 megawatts straight from beans. Really puts the plant in power plant. And before anyone types it in the comments, yes I know I can use fluid heat exchangers to get an efficiency bonus and essentially get more power for free, but I figured that out after building it and this will cover up all my power demands far into the future so I'm just gonna not worry about it. Alright, with power taken care of, I can get back to worrying about the sludge. Seeing as this base is going to be entirely centered around rails, I'm gonna be putting the finished sludge onto tanker trains. Now some of you might be thinking that it's much better to connect the pump and tank directly and that this way of doing it is extremely slow for loading fluid. Well, you're right, but I'm trying to keep this compact, and fitting a tank and a pump requires five spaces adjacent to the rails, meaning I need to move the rails up by two. Unfortunately for all the some dozen new fluid tanks this mod added, it didn't add a single 2x2 two two tank that you can fill from the side. But comparatively, the sludge stack itself makes sludge slower than the extra time it would take to fill a train, so it's not like it's being limited by the loading speed. The lower rail is for dropping off charcoal, the only thing I'm missing to actually make the sludge. I hand feed some charcoal from the old base just to make sure this thing's working alright, but that's what I'm off to make next. So before I was making charcoal from green algae, but that's very space intensive, power intensive, and slower compared to the alternative. The alternative being farming. Yes, farming isn't just for beans. And I'm expanding my horizons to a new crop called Tianaton. Unfortunately, the trade-off is that it's much more complicated than algae, and it's also much more complicated than farming Beanafran. That's because instead of sand, it's a temperate crop that requires soil, and to make soil we need mud and compost. The compost comes from throwing some of the finished Tianaton into a composter, while the mud once again comes from washing plants. 
It takes a lot of mud, and mud is quite annoying to get because the recipe from the washing plants itself has only a 50% chance to make between 1 and 3 chunks of mud. It's much less convenient than sand. There's actually a plant called Zombie Eucalyptus that's even better for making beans, but it takes so much mud I decided to stick with Beanafran for power. Regardless, seeing as we need some to make the seeds and compost, about 40% of all the Tianaton we grow will need to go into growing the next batch, but the rest can go straight to processing and, once again, trying to keep things relatively compact. Tianaton is special because the process is down to pure cellulose, which we can finally turn into wooden pellets, then wooden blocks, and finally fire into a furnace to create the charcoal we'll need to filter the mineral sludge, as well as about a million other things. We'll put that onto a train, and with the power of train tracks, we can bring it into those charcoal stops I mentioned earlier. With charcoal in hand, we can turn on our sludge stacks. Because the amount of charcoal they need is comparatively small, I've got several stops on the same line that will only be open to trains when the chest is below a certain limit and needs to be topped off. And there it is. The heart of our real base is finally beating and ready to fill its veins with sludge. Unlike my old build, now that it's built into a rail network, I could paste one of these anywhere and get sludge to where I need it with no more effort than a few train tracks. I've got no idea how much sludge this thing pumps out, but it doesn't really matter anymore because if it's ever not enough, I can just paste another one. That's the beauty of building modular designs like this. Apart from their intrinsic beauty, of course. I mean, look at this thing. It's beautiful. Now, seeing as we've got mineral sludge, it follows logically that we should build something to use it. And I'm actually using Hellmod for the first time in my life because trying to figure out the ratios to a 10 item long recipe chain in my head is a bit much, even for me. The sludge comes in on this dead end stop that gets unloaded into pipes and feeds the crystallizers, again with a slower unloading design. The stop only holds one train that only leaves once it's empty, so unloading speed isn't a priority here. And it'll be a while before I can actually use them, but I'm also leaving some space for beacons, just to make this thing a little more future-proof. All the ores need to be crushed, which can conveniently fit in the spaces between the crystallizers. And as you'll recall, that generates quite a substantial amount of crushed stone as a byproduct. That big rail through the middle of the sludge stacks was intended as a way to offload crushed stone, but looking at it objectively, it's not really worth it, and I'd rather not clog up my rail system with wagon after wagon of mostly useless crush. So I'll be throwing it all into a liquefier and turning it into mineralized water, only to flush it down the toilet. The sludge stacks themselves are already flushing an obscene amount of mineral water, and while I could use it elsewhere to get some extra ores, it's just not worth the headache when pasting more stacks is so much easier now. Again, conveniently, it fits in between. And now we just need to make some catalysts from the sludge and start sorting out the ores. This whole thing is just to make iron ore. My general strategy moving forwards is to create an entire block dedicated to one resource, so that way if I need more iron, I can just paste another one. Now, it may seem like I'm just rebuilding what I've already done before, but this is where it diverges a bit, because now I can build the maximum tier of ore processing, which uses these processed pellets. There's three tiers of smelting for each ore, and each step adds plus 50% productivity, which is to say, by doing this, I get out twice as many iron plates per iron ore put in compared to the tier 1 recipe. Imagine being able to fit 10 tier 3 productivity modules into a single furnace in the base game. However, that comes at a cost, and it's complexity. It's not exactly a free productivity bonus either, because it does require other items, like limestone in this case that I'm rather proud of managing to fit in here, and charcoal, which comes by train. Seeing as I'm trying to build compact, the adjustable inserters are very convenient for unloading a train with limited space. The charcoal as an ingredient is convenient because it can double as fuel for the furnaces. Unlike the base game, there's no escaping needing burnable fuel for your forges. Because iron ingots are needed elsewhere for things like steel ingots, I'm going to put them on a train, but the rest goes into the induction furnaces to be turned into molten iron. Pretty straightforward and similar to what we've done before, but this part's a bit different. Remember those strand casters I used to make copper coil? Well, I can use them to make iron sheets as well. They're a bit bigger and a lot more annoying to deal with because of the fluid inputs, but it's definitely worth it. Not only that, but when you turn them into plates, you can use productivity modules to get even more out of them. And while I haven't set it up yet, there's a recipe that uses coolant instead of water, and that'll give you an extra 15% sheets on top of everything. So yeah, they're pretty good. I just love this way of loading two trains next to each other, which is only possible thanks to my, how shall we say, unique way of designing train networks. But here it is, the iron build. We have only scratched the surface, however, and it's time to move on to the next resource down the list. Copper. Thankfully, I can simply copy my design that makes all the ores and paste it here. Building like this is extremely daunting, but as you go along, you get more and more designs that you can just copy, and it becomes much less painful. 
All I need to do is change the recipes in the crystallizers and crushers to match the ores I need for copper ore, and it's good to go. We also process the ores and turn it into pellets, but copper has a vastly different chain than iron. They're all different, and now I need oxygen gas. Fortunately, there's a near inexhaustible supply coming out of my sludge stack, so I just need to build a train there to collect it. In the middle of doing that, I take a quick trip over to the old base to set up the pure titanium ore processing I recently unlocked because my mixed ore recipes aren't making enough titanium to meet the demand of my new builds. Again, just a stopgap measure, and needing to occasionally come by and blow up the overfilled ore silos is the exact reason I'm centering my new base around the pure ore sorting. Back to copper. We're also going to need sulfuric acid, which, unlike limestone for the iron, is actually a precious commodity. The sludge stacks will always produce a little extra, so I can skim some sulfuric acid off the top, but in the future, I'll want a more reliable source. Now we bring the oxygen in by train, and use it to turn our copper pellets into copper anodes. The fuel for the blast furnace is just borrowed from the iron build. It's not the best for modularity for it to not have its own fuel source, but if I need to paste it elsewhere and it's a problem, I'll just bring it in with requester chests. Those cathodes can go into these chemical furnaces, which is what we needed all that sulfuric acid for. We'll need a lot more chemical furnaces to tackle the output of the blast furnaces, which illustrates the importance of reading the crafting times. But as soon as they're through, we've got our copper ingots. Again, there's a few things that take copper ingots as ingredients, so it all goes onto a train. But just like before, we can throw those into an induction furnace to make molten copper and pump that into casting machines. However, unlike iron, copper can be cast into sheets and wires. I cannot overstate how convenient copper wire is for making cables, because the crafting recipe to turn it into copper cable is four times faster than making it from plates on top of all the other benefits to cast metals I've already mentioned. You'll see exactly what I mean when I get around to making circuits in a hundred years, but that's copper up and running. If you want to play a game at home, look at the playtime when I started work on one of these builds, and again when I finish and see how long it takes me. As expected, the excess sulfur from the sludge filtration isn't quite enough. It probably would be if the base was full size, but since I'm gonna want it anyway, now's a good time as any to build an alternate source of sulfuric acid. There's only one other way to get sulfuric acid in this mod, and it's a little obscure. For about the billionth time, we're gonna do some mud washing. We're after limestone again, but this time a whole lot of it. Now, mud washing invariably creates mud, and while I can turn that mud into landfill and shove it in a box, that's just another thing that can get clogged up and deadlocked with enough time. So to make it to where I don't need to deal with all that, I can shove all the mud into liquefiers along with some water and turn it back into mud water. Theoretically, I could route it back into the start of the mud washing process to get rid of it, but I only thought of it now and it doesn't really fit anymore, so into the clarifiers it goes. We'll want to turn that limestone into lime with some blast furnaces. Seeing as we're right below the charcoal build, we'll just borrow some fuel. So I built this whole thing and was pretty proud of it until I realized that the undergrounds for the belts carrying fuel is too short to span the distance but thankfully I can research some more advanced belts with longer undergrounds. The lime baking process produces a significant amount of carbon dioxide, and that stuff is actually pretty useful, so we'll be loading that onto trains for use elsewhere. Not as the main source, but a source. And seeing as it's not technically what we're after, if the tanks start getting too full, we'll vent the excess to keep it from clogging up the machines. The purpose of all this lime is to create these porous lime filters. Using these filters, we can stuff them into some air purifiers along with some water to extract sulfuric wastewater from the atmosphere. And to get any appreciable amount, we're going to need a lot of air filters. Who knew there was so much sulfur in the atmosphere? Me, actually, considering I'm probably the one who put it there in the first place. Yes, here at Dosh Industries, we're dedicated to cleaning up every ecological disasters we caused ourselves. The sulfuric waste moves onto the hydro plants to extract the sulfur. We don't need the mineral water, and we'll want to get rid of some of the purified water, so down the toilet they go. And I know I didn't need this many clarifiers, but I've got the empty space, so I might as well use it. With that, we've extracted the sulfur, and we'll just need to bring in some more oxygen to turn it into sulfur dioxide. This whole design ended up being a bit of a mess, and I don't want to talk about it. But the sulfur dioxide combines with the purified water we get from the hydro plants to make sulfuric acid, which I'm putting right next to the rails. Now all that's left is to turn it on and to get some of that precious wastewater. Or is it? Yeah, so it works for a moment and then quickly clogs up. The culprit being that I'm an idiot and didn't realize that the air filters spit out used lime filters instead of empty frames. And to get the empty frames back, we need to clean them up in some liquefiers. Somehow I managed to fit enough liquefiers to mostly meet demand, and from there we just need to insert the frames back into the assemblers to recharge them with lime and send them off to be filtered though cleaning them creates a gas I hadn't accounted for, acid air. 
and I considered venting it all into the atmosphere for, you know, sustainability reasons, like a sort of catch and release, but as it turns out, it's an even better source of sulfur than the wastewater. Dealing with it is a bit of a headache because it takes these advanced chemical plants and green catalysts, which are always a pain. But the amount of ores the catalysts need is quite small, so we can bring them in via requester chest to continually recharge the empty catalyst frames that the plants spit out. Once we're done with all that, we've got good old hydrogen sulfide, which can be turned into pure sulfur. But beyond that, we've also got some carbon dioxide and some hydrogen fluoride gas, which is actually very useful because it makes hydrofluoric acid for free. This sort of thing illustrates how tangled this mod can become, where in my quest to make sulfuric acid, I ended up serendipitously creating three other byproducts I'll need in the form of hydrofluoric acid, sulfur, and sulfuric wastewater, as well as some free CO2. But it also illustrates how efficiently putting it all into trains can disentangle it. It was a lot of effort, but the end result is that the copper now has plenty of acid to drink. Back to the resource grind, and this time I've got my eyes on tin. So once again we paste our generic ore design and we're good to go. It's easy to forget when the buildings seem to come out of nowhere, but everything is being created by my old base, and quite slowly might I add. But the fact that it takes me several hours to finish one of these builds means that the 50-something crystallizers each one needs is usually done by then. Now tin I can get into. Tin is probably the easiest tier 3 recipe chain because it only takes carbon, which is made by combining charcoal and steam in a liquefier. I can get the steam from some electric boilers, and even though I could use blasting charges to install an offshore pump, these groundwater bores will be enough, even though they only make a twentieth as much water per second. It fits pretty neatly right next to the rails, and thanks to the super long inserters, I can insert it into the blast furnaces directly from the liquefiers. It even doubles as a fuel. All in all, pretty painless. And now we melt them. You'll notice a lot of similarities in these designs. Just like copper, we can make tin sheets and tin wire. But to actually make the tin wire, we need to bring in some molten copper as well. I tack on an extra train to the copper build to transport it to the tin build. It might seem silly when the molten copper is right next door and I could just run a pipe, but again, this design is to make it more generic and expandable. Making tin cable like this is very convenient, as you'll see towards the end of this video. Okay, now that I've built enough of it for you to see what it looks like, I think it's about time I addressed the train network. Let me just be very clear when I tell you that this design is not optimal by any stretch of the imagination. The only reason I can make it look like this is because I have thousands of hours of experience and dreamin' train signals, so keep that in mind if you want to try and replicate it and don't complain when it gets deadlocked. Most of the rails are two-way, allowing the trains to go whichever direction they want down these tracks. You'd expect it to get deadlocked as a train entering the track bumps noses with a train trying to leave, but with very careful use of chain signals, I can make it so that a train can only enter the track if the entire thing is clear. There are some places that have regular rail signals because I'm merging two ways and one ways like an insane person, but the entrances to the train stops also have rail signals. You can think of places with rail signals as allowing the trains there to park. When it comes to signals, some people chant the mantra, chain in, rail out, but it's more like, if you're fine with a train parking in that block ahead of the signal, use a rail signal. And I couldn't imagine a better example than this monstrosity. You might be thinking, but allowing only one train at a time limits throughput. And you'd be exactly right. But it's funny, and it does have its advantages if I'm trying to keep everything compact. That being said, I didn't choose this design just to be wacky. The trains themselves are much more powerful compared to their vanilla counterparts. The Mark III locomotives going nearly twice as fast, and the Mark III wagons capable of carrying twice as much. That combined with the fact that most everything in this mod stacks to 200, and you can imagine a single wagon being able to carry 4 wagons worth of iron plates compared to the base game. And 16 wagons when we factor in that we'll be transporting sheets and coils instead of plates. So basically, despite being small and maneuverable, these trains are quite powerful. We're working on lead, and unlike the others, I'm not going to be using the Tier 3 recipe. And that's because it just plain sucks. It takes tons of hydrofluoric acid and silicon ores just to make 50% more lead when just making more crystallizers is almost certainly preferable to using up the rather expensive hydrofluoric. And lead just isn't a very important metal anyway. It's used in some sciences, but nowhere near the quantities of something like copper, iron, or aluminum. Despite that, you'll notice that regardless of the resource, I've been making the same amount of ore crystallization for each. And that's because I've got no idea about how much I'll need in the future, so I decided that it'll be better to use a generic design that I can copy rather than trying to guess the demands of an endgame base I haven't even built yet. Anyway, since we're using the Tier 2 recipes, we don't use ore pellets and instead just processed ore. With some oxygen, we make lead oxide, and that spits out some sulfur dioxide byproduct, which is useful but too much effort to deal with, so we just vent it. You know, give our new air filtration plants something to think about. That goes into the blast furnaces along with some carbon, and we're back to ingots. 
then melting and casting into sheets just like iron. And there we have our lead. We're officially done with the four basic metals. Only ten more to go. Oh boy. I revamped the oxygen loading a bit and put it at the bottom here, tossing in some more two-way rail as well. It's short, but it's the only places where my trains can stop to let other trains pass, so even if they're disjointed, they still help throughput. This design's a lot more final now, with oxygen pickup below, hydrogen and sulfuric acid on the left, and mineralized water on the right. And the reason I shorted it up is because I'm going to do this, illustrating once again the power of these modular rail-based designs. This thing might look huge, but it's enough to supply maybe one of the ore blocks at maximum throughput, at least until I can add beacons and modules. It's insane how much industry you need for this mod, but you can get pretty far with the kludge. Hence my old base still working tirelessly to support this expansion endeavor. While that slowly builds, I've got to get started on one of the bigger challenges, and that's oil processing. You should remember oil processing from the last video, and this time we're doing that, but much bigger. Oil starts life as blue algae, which is grown in these algae farms. I'm switching over to bronze pipes because A, they look better, and B, all of the titanium pipes are currently tied up in making that giga sludge blueprint I just stamped down. They do have a much smaller underground length, however, but that's not a factor when all I need them to do is span the distance between two farms. I know I'm glossing over much of these designs, but we've got a lot to cover. My main hope is that you can look at the belts and inserters and generally understand what's going on while I talk about the broad philosophies that influence the design. But if I talked about everything, this video would be 10 hours long. Anyway, to make blue algae we need CO2 and sulfuric wastewater, which we can both get from our air filtration build. Having an alternate source of wastewater is especially useful because extracting it from the sludge stacks is much more difficult than acid, because I can't just bleed off the excess with an overflow valve, seeing as the only way to know if there's an excess is if there's enough acid. But anyway, it's convenient. Yeah, count how many times I say convenient this video. We can use some of that carbon dioxide byproduct we get from the lime furnaces, but the CO2 created by the lime to make the sulfuric waste isn't enough to remain balanced with the demand, so we'll need to supplement it, and that comes from charcoal. And because of my designs, I had to make a special stop for a double-headed charcoal train so it could fit in here, but that's one massive blue algae farm up and running. Next step in the process is to turn it into blue cellulose with some assembling machines, but we'll also want to shove it into liquefiers to create ammonia gas. There's another recipe to make ammonia that uses hydrogen, which is also basically free from the slag creation process, as well as nitrogen, which comes from the air, and I might make a dedicated block for that if demand ends up being high enough, but for the time being, it's just good to have on hand. Here's the thing working, but we've only just begun our oil journey. That moves on to these oil and gas separators. I know that some of you who like to watch these videos don't even play Factorio, but I hope you can understand what's going on here with these pipe designs that connect the outputs of all the buildings together into one pipe network. The goal of this process is to make multi-phase oil, and that spits out sulfuric waste and CO2 as a byproduct. But seeing as those are used to create the cellulose in the first place, we're more than happy to route those back into the first step to ease off the demand. It also takes steam, a lot of steam, and this time we actually do want offshore pumps to feed these boilers. The multi-phase oil is routed through the middle and ready for the next step, turning the multi-phase oil into crude oil. It also spits out sulfuric wastewater, but some stuff called raw gas as well. We'll get to that. With the crude oil, we move on to the actual refining. The refining process takes hydrogen, so we just add some stops to bring it in. There's no real meaning behind having two hydrogen stops, I just like symmetry. So apart from that, the refining is similar to how it is in the base game, taking in two fluids and giving out three, except now we get out naphtha, fuel oil, and base mineral oil, as well as some oil residuals. It seems straightforward, but it's really not, and that's because of everything that comes after refining it. So unlike the base game where we can just crack all the oils down to petroleum gas, we need all three of these in different amounts, and the game's not kind enough to make balancing it easy. We have two recipes, one that makes primarily naphtha and one that makes primarily mineral oil. Instead of consuming hydrogen, the recipe that makes mineral oil consumes residual gas, which comes from the oil residuals and steam. On top of that, we're going to want to turn that raw gas into natural gas liquids. That gives off acid air, which you might recall, but too much effort vented into the atmosphere. Okay, stay with me here. We have five different fluids we'll want on trains, and one of them is quite important. Lubricant is made from mineral oil and residual gas, and is made in chemical plants, and y y you know, just look at this mess. Ignore this thing that makes synthesis gas, I built it thinking I might have excess residual gas, but that's basically impossible, so this part's worthless. 
Anyway, as I mentioned, the refineries give out different amounts, and we need to keep everything in balance, and that means venting the excess, but it's not enough to just vent the excess, otherwise we'd waste tons of our resources by permanently burning everything. What we can do is make a series of combinators for each tank, and set it to only allow flow to burn off naphtha if it's full, and either mineral oil or fuel oil is near empty, and then doing the same for the other two. That way we'll ensure the relative balance, but we can do a bit better. Again, there's two recipes for refining, one that makes mostly naphtha, and one that makes mostly mineral oil. But how do we choose between them? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be using math. Basically, I want to turn off one if there's too much of that, and not enough the other, and vice versa, but also keep both on if they're balanced. I can achieve this by taking the value of the mineral oil and naphtha in the tanks and dividing them by each other to get a ratio, and then I can use that resulting signal to control the pumps and disable the naphtha recipe if there's twice as much naphtha as mineral oil. There's another way to deal with it by converting the excess into synthesis gas, then turning that into the desired fluid, but it takes much more effort than just intelligently controlling the production in the first place. Oh yeah, I also downloaded Pipe Visualizer, which will be great to demonstrate the fluid connections the three times I remember to turn it on this video. Here's me finally making the hydrofluoric acid and putting it on trains. Just add water. So that was a lot of effort, but considering it gave me six different useful fluids, it's a big step forwards. It also means I can finalize my strand casting design. Remember when I mentioned coolant? Well, I couldn't make it until I had a reliable source of mineral oil available. Making the coolant itself is easy, it's just oil and water in a chemical plant, but when the casting machines consume it, it spits out used coolant, which needs to be cooled down in a three-step process using these cooling towers. And these things are kind of annoying because you can't make them compact thanks to all the fluid boxes. Oh yeah, and you see me assuming I can just vent the steam, but you can't. Go figure. Anyway, once it's cooled, the used fluid gets filtered, and then it can be used as coolant once again, losing maybe 20% of the original coolant in the process. We want to make sure that there's always room for the recycled coolant so the plants only make coolant if the tank is below half capacity. Since these things don't need much mineral oil, I've got the oil tank hooked up to a combinator that outputs the L signal when it's below a certain limit, and that signal sets the train limit from 0 to 1. That means one train can service as many of these coolant stops as I care to slap down. Also, the filtration plants are using charcoal filters for now. I can use ceramic filters, which only need water to be recycled, but I don't have those yet because for some reason the research costs 1,000 science. So we'll get around to that later. This is just for demonstration. It's all set up for when I do get it, though. I had to make some adjustments to the strand casters to fit the coolant, but here it is in action. 15% more productivity for free, and it's twice as fast. Oh yeah, and the real way to get rid of steam is to put it in another cooling tower and turn it to water. And once again, it's back to the resource grind. We're after the next tier of ores this time. We'll start with aluminum, and while we can use the same ore crystallization and crushing design as before, if you recall, we'll need to process the base ores even further before we can turn it into aluminum ore, and we'll be using these flotation cells to do that. They take in purified water, so we'll need a good number of hydro plants to support it, but flotation cells are a much bigger challenge. That's because of their byproducts. Not only do they output different kinds of wastewaters depending on the type of ore they're processing, but they also spit out differently colored geodes that we'll need to deal with. The funny thing is, we actually want the geodes, and that's because unlike the other ores, we'll need a crystal catalyst to make the pure stuff, and that comes from dissolving the geodes in sulfuric acid and turning them into crystal slurry, and then filtering that to create crystal seedlings. We actually want geodes so much, we're going to be building a washing plant in between the flotation cells because the geodes from creating the ore chunks aren't enough to create the catalysts needed to consume those chunks. We can get geodes from consuming heavy mud water to get a random assortment of different colored ones. Sorry if this feels like I'm restating stuff from the last video. In any case, we managed to squeeze this thing in here to make some supplemental geodes and filter it. We'll be using ceramic filters here for the convenience of cleaning them with just water. We'll also need a bit of sulfuric acid. Not much, though. Now I'm gonna tell you up front, I miscalculated and this one geode plant still isn't enough to meet the catalyst demand, but running at 80% throughput is enough for now, and I don't know, I'll fix it in the next video or something. Now you see all this. This is supposed to deal with the wastewater output of the flotation cells, but just ignore it. What's important is we can finally create aluminum ore, using the same ore sorting blueprint as the others, except with crystal catalysts this time. I've also got a wire hooking up the crystal seedling tank to the seafloor pump that feeds the geode washing plant to shut it off if it gets too full so it doesn't get clogged after long periods of inactivity. But the ore is about as far as we can get for now. We'll need a couple more resources before we can continue on to the third tier of aluminum smelting. And the first one we'll need is sodium carbonate. It's pretty easy, even if we do need a lot of it, and that's because it just takes brown algae. So here we are making another massive algae farm. 
but unlike blue algae, it just takes saline water, which we can get infinitely for free from a bunch of saline plants. Then we'll need a bunch of purified water, and if you've been following along, you'll know that that means a bunch of hydro plants. But this time we can skip getting rid of the saline water it spits out and just route it back into the farms to get rid of it. Then we just shove that into a bunch of liquefiers, and voila, sodium carbonate. So I decided to knock out sodium hydroxide solution production while I'm here, just in case I need it later. And again, decide to make the much more annoying recipe that requires electrolyzers and recycling electrodes, but whatever, there it is. I don't know about you, but I'm finding it much easier to explain my gameplay when I'm hard focused on building one massive block at a time. And we get this great view of industry when we're done too. We bring that back to our aluminum block, along with some charcoal as well. And I say block, but what I really mean is weird rectangle, because I'm too cool to use uniform city block designs. Anyway, that combines with the pellets and creates some sodium aluminate. You'll see those belts on the side feeding back into the carbonate belt, and uh, that's for the next step. But we can't do that yet because we need another ingredient. Just like the tier 1 recipe, we'll need some sodium hydroxide, and that can only come from zapping salt water and some electrolyzers, and that requires an incredible amount of salt water. Once again, the salination plants save the day. So this whole process spits out sodium hydroxide, but it also spits out chlorine and hydrogen. Now if sodium hydroxide was all we were after, we'd be done here, but while I'm building this, I might as well set it up to make a whole host of things we can make out of chlorine. Hydrogen chloride is one of them. It's super simple and just requires combining the chlorine and hydrogen in chemical plants. It's got a handful of uses, and we'll want both that and chlorine gas on the transfer use later. But beyond that, there's a bunch of other ones we can knock out while we're here as well. I'm skipping through this part because I assume you can figure out what these hydro plants are doing by now, but then we combine that purified water with the sodium hydroxide that makes it pass the trans to create even more sodium hydroxide solution. Yes, the smart way of making it. Except I'm not making it just to use it, I'm making it so I can flush it down the toilet. Chlorine gas is actually really important for later recipes, and by letting this get rid of excess hydroxide if there's no chlorine gas, it'll clear up the belt so the electrolyzers can make more. But it has some legitimate uses too, because while we'll flush it if there's an excess, we'll also use it combined with the gases to create sodium hypochlorite and sodium chlorate. I mentioned this last video, but again, if you're obsessed with beating a mod like this, you'll definitely burn yourself out. And for the last 50 hours of this run, I've been in the zen of hopping on, playing a few hours and finishing a block, and then hopping off and not worrying too much about the next step. I'd recommend it, and this kind of base design makes it really easy to visualize your progress. It'll probably be a while before we need these, but when we do need them, we'll be glad that it's just one train stop away. Alrighty, back to aluminum. We needed the sodium hydroxide to make alumina, along with the aluminate we made earlier, as well as some carbon dioxide. Conveniently, the previous step also used charcoal, so now we've got it on site to not only fuel the blast furnaces, but also make the CO2 necessary. And it's double great because the next step to make the ingots actually takes carbon, so we get to use it again. They don't need much, so directly inserting from these two liquefiers is enough. You'll also notice that the alumina is being directly inserted into the ingot furnaces, but it also spits out some sodium carbonate as a byproduct, which will route back into the previous step with priority input, so it consumes that first. And this is the best part, because it means all the hard stuff is behind us. We just paste the induction furnace design we've been using, and the casting machine designs, as well as the loading stations, and finally the coolant blueprint. This is what Factorio's all about. Watching one of these complex builds roar to life is my favorite part about Factorio, and I hope it's yours too. But before we move on, I'm horrified to remember that while I'm using the pure ore sorting, there are other recipes that spit out unwanted ores like aluminum, and I'll need a way to get rid of them. Thankfully, I just so happened to leave enough room in this design to fit a train that could unload ore with priority input to get rid of any ore byproducts from the other processes. Way to go, me. I start preparing for the next resource, but then it hits me. I really, really hate this wastewater treatment that I've shoved into the middle of the build like this. I'm trying to keep these designs as self-contained as possible, but it's just too annoying and it doesn't even work right. So I'm tearing it out and deconstructing this entire thing just to move it up several tiles. Better now than never, I suppose. I'm just gonna dispose of the waste for now, but since I'm making all these in parallel, I'm gonna connect all the waste water by pipe so I can extract it and recycle it elsewhere. Anyway, we're making silicon this time, and it also takes some carbon. Well, that's not exactly right. It doesn't take carbon, but the first step to making tier 3 silicon is silane gas, and strangely enough, it takes aluminum ingots to make. 24 to be precise, and when it's done, it spits out another 24 alumina. That's what the carbon is for, turning that back into ingots, because as long as you use the advanced aluminum ingots recipe, you'll be able to continuously recycle the same ingots over and over. Once we've got the silane gas, it's straight to ingots. Yes, we need the gas to make silicon ingots, but we also need silicon ingots to make silicon ingots. 
It takes in six, but spits out four times as much. Just like the previous recipe, we're going to be continually recycling the ingots and routing them back into the start of the process. And all that looks like is a couple priority output splitters that ensure that the input belt to the furnaces is fully saturated before they'll allow any ingots to escape the system via the other side of the splitter. It's a good thing melting time is consistent across all the ingots, so we can just use the same blueprint every time, seeing as I'm setting up every process to make about 96 ingots a second at maximum throughput. This is where the similarities end, however, because we can't just use our casting machine design, since there's no such thing as silicon sheets. Instead, we have this rather complex recipe, starting with using the raw ore to make quartz crucibles. Next, we'll need some nitrogen, and that comes from an air filter, followed by a chemical plant to extract the oxygen and nitrogen. We just vent the oxygen, and we use that to create silicon seeds. It's been a while since we've seen the standard casting machines. With the crucibles and seeds, we can finally start thinking about turning them into monosilicon. Except this thing ended up being pretty complicated, because it's kind of hard to keep things symmetrical in this narrow space, while also managing to fit enough casting machines. The worst part is that while spitting out monosilicon, it also has an 80% chance to give back the crucible, so that means we need a filter splitter to separate it from the monosilicon we want, and a priority input splitter that feeds back into the input belts. Also, since we've got both the seeds and the crucibles on one belt, we need to make sure that the crucibles we're trying to merge in is on the same side of the belt as well. The end result of all that is this. It doesn't really have room for beacons, but whatever. I'll cross that bridge when we get there. Immediately, we're on to the next resource. Silver. And let me tell you, this was probably the most convoluted recipe I had to deal with. I was tempted to use the tier 2 smelting because of how annoying it is, but silver is a major resource in the production of circuits, so it's definitely worth it. The crux of the issue is this sodium silver cyanide. The ingredients are annoying enough on their own, but this sodium cyanide is the worst. I would have been more than happy to tack it onto my last sodium build and ship it in, but look at the recipe again. It spits out sodium hydroxide as a byproduct. That's an ingredient in the sodium we need, but it means that if I wanted to ship in sodium cyanide, I'd need to ship out sodium hydroxide, so the best option is just make it here so I can recycle it. But as you can see, it requires this massive mess of electrolyzers, chemical plants, catalysts, and carbon. The only good part is I don't need much of it, but what a headache. And it's the only thing that's forced me to break symmetry thus far. After all that, we actually get to make the stuff. Similar to the aluminum with its carbonate byproduct, we'll take all the hydroxide and route it back into the electrolyzers to be reused. Then all that goes into another set of chemical furnaces to become silver cathodes. At least this recipe is easy, but since I'm trying to make all these blocks relatively similar length, I've got a lot of space to win back considering that previous step, so it's a bit compact. Now it's finally time to turn them into ingots. Like last recipe, it's one ingredient and one product, almost like an apology for that first step, but we still need to fuel them. We get to melt them down as per the norm, but just like tin, we're able to make silver-coated wire, and that means leaving space for another train carrying molten copper, as well as altering the casting machine design a bit to accept two fluid inputs. This build ended up too long to fit the coolant at the end, but fortunately silicon doesn't use coolant, and that means I can just fit it there instead. Ah, silver. Being able to watch it like this almost makes the whole thing worth it. Well, there's still loads more to go, and so we're doing nickel next. Also, I learned a valuable lesson about what happens when your construction robots use a blasting charge underneath you. This amount of ore production for nickel is extreme overkill. But hey, even if it wasn't more aesthetic, it's still easier to paste an existing blueprint than specialize one. Thankfully, it's pretty easy, and all we need is some carbon monoxide, which comes from carbon and purified water, and we need some sulfur, which we can get from the air filtering build. It's a bit of an awkward squeeze, but it works thanks to the cursed capabilities of the adjustable inserters. That combines with the pellets to make nickel carbonyl, and that can go straight into ingots. Just like the silicon ingots, we'll need to route them back in as input, but we solve it the exact same way, and that's nickel ingots. Yep, that's it. There's no molten nickel, no nickel sheets, just the ingots. They're used as a precursor in several metal alloys, but that's about it. We put that on a train and move on. The base is filling out rather nicely, but we've still got a long way to go, he says, becoming increasingly nervous as this video is already over 40 minutes long and only halfway through the footage. I was getting a little fatigued by all the smelting, so I went to the old base to build some more concrete. I considered making a mod that swapped the tiles of the modded and base concretes, but after looking through the code, I relented and decided that just sucking it up and automating it would be much faster. Unfortunately, it's much more expensive to make than regular concrete, but it'll be a hundred hours before I use any of this stuff anyway. Then I tack on sodium to the existing saltwater electrolysis build. Not because I've got anything in mind, but just because I can and it's better to fit it in now before I start trying to build around to this thing and end up limiting my space. 
I also set up hydrochloric acid, one of the four acids, and very important for the near future. Then there's this sodium perchlorate, which you might remember from the start as being used to make rocket boosters. It's also got other uses, but I mainly made it so I can bring it to the old base via requester chests and speed up my rocket booster production. I never got around to mentioning it until now, but these Mark III trains have five fuel slots and rocket boosters stack to 200, so these double-headed trains each need 2,000 boosters before they can stop pulling from the refueling chests. I feel like most of these trains won't even consume that much throughout this entire run. The only saving grace is that I only need to stand up a new train once every hour or so. Anyway, to finish off the middle tier ores, we've got zinc. Zinc is similar to nickel in that it's only used in alloys and certain more efficient ways of making molten metals, but luckily it's pretty easy. It does take sulfuric acid, however. Some people online told me to skip the third tier of zinc smelting because the sulfuric acid isn't worth the extra ores, kind of like lead, but it doesn't seem too bad so long as we've got our air filtration plants up. The first step just takes oxygen and zinc pellets, but it spits out some sulfur dioxide, and that's handy because we can turn that straight into sulfuric acid with the addition of a little purified water in a chemical plant and use that to feed the next step of the process. So all things considered, its acid consumption isn't that bad. The zinc oxide is also used in like, one other minor recipe too, so it's good to know that I won't need to worry about that like I would've needed to if I went with the second tier smelting. The zinc cathode build ended up looking a lot like the silver cathodes, and similarly, they're the only ingredient we need to make zinc ingots, as long as we've got a blast furnace, which I'm fueling with this cursed belt borrowed from the nickel. Put it on trains, and that's zinc. We're slowly but steadily checking everything off the list. I mentioned alloys, and that's what I'm gonna make next, starting with solder. We've got plenty of space, so I'm gonna put it below the nickel. Because it's an alloy, all we need to do is train in all of the ingots necessary to make it. And I'd just like to shout out these crazy unloading designs that you can make with these adjustable inserters. To make solder, all we need to do is combine tin ingots and zinc ingots in an induction furnace to create molten solder. There's multiple recipes, but they all take tin and something more valuable than zinc, so zinc and tin it is. Then we can turn those into solder coils. We won't get to use these until we get around to making circuits, but they're very important and work just like the wire coils. Next up is bronze, and it takes three different ingots, so I've got to make an even better unloader. Bronze is almost useless, honestly. It's used in making some buildings, but not in any science, so this thing is already pretty overkill. Another alloy is brass, and it also takes three different ingots. It can use the exact same design as before, and the difference is this one's actually used in science, at least a little bit, so we'll make a little extra production. And then we'll make Inver, again just copy-pasting the same design. Inver is also used in science, but only military science, which we don't really need now that we have artillery, so this is also a bit overkill. Right next door I'm setting up Cobalt Steel. Can't turn this or the Inver on though, because I'm missing Cobalt and I'm missing Steel, but this one's also used in science, so this one gets a bit more production than the others as well. Speaking of steel, it's about time we made some. It's a bit more complex than the other alloys because it takes iron ingots and oxygen. A lot of iron ingots, actually. It takes four iron ingots to make one steel ingot. I have concerns about throughput, so I gave it two iron ingot stops even though we have only one source of them at the moment. Those steel ingots will go onto trains for the alloys, but we also need to make molten steel. You can make molten steel purely from steel ingots, but those cost four iron ingots each, so it's much better to use one of the other recipes that allows you to mix in other ingots like nickel and cobalt to create the same amount of molten steel, saving you tons of iron. We don't have cobalt yet though, so it'll remain dormant. Next thing I'm setting up ahead of time is nitinol, another thing I can't make yet because it takes nickel and titanium. I mean I could make it, but not properly from the real base, you know? It also has no use in science, but it's necessary for pretty much every high-level building, so it's definitely good to have. Walking through all this, this base has definitely become quite imposing. Sometimes it's crazy to walk through something like this and remember that at some point in time, you actually built all this stuff. Time to make it even more imposing. Now that I'm done with the five middle tier ores, I decide to set up the wastewater cleaning in this empty space to the right. Sometimes it's hard to fit something useful in every inch of the map, but we're gonna make it work. The four different kinds of wastewater can be turned into the four different kinds of acids. Well, there's more than four acids, but these are the four important acids. They all use hydro plants and spit out some kind of solid along with some water. Sulfuric waste is the most abundant kind, and the other three take sulfuric acid plus whatever solid their wastewater spit out to turn it into that acid. They also spit out some byproducts that need to be dealt with. I'm not going to dwell too much on it, and it's not just because I forgot to record building half of it, but because it's not the greatest and I'm eventually going to redesign it. Next video. The reason is that allowing only single wagon trains into the station severely limited how effectively I could use it.
I guess this way of getting rid of the sodium sulfate is interesting, where we turn it to sodium and sulfur, route the sulfur back to the sulfuric acid plants, and then turn the sodium into hydroxide, then hydroxide solution, and finally get rid of it. Yeah, but that's wastewater. So there's one more sort of submaterial I've got left to make. It's not exactly an alloy, but it does take this alumina, which I totally forgot to plan for. I managed to route it through and fit it on this random stop here. Even these new designs have slight oversight sometimes, but when it's only one or two, it's much easier to squeeze in as opposed to, like, ten. Also, I'm pasting another sludge array. The material we're after is glass, and it's also got its own fancy recipe. One of the ingredients is lime, but would you look at that, we've already built a way to mass-produce lime. I swear every time I get to paste a blueprint like this, it gives me a rush of endorphins. There's a quote-unquote more advanced recipe for glass, but it takes sodium carbonate and sodium sulfate, which is much more annoying to create than lime, especially when we already have a blueprint. Unlike last build, we need to actually bring in some fuel for the furnaces, which results in this awkward train stop. Again, we've got the stops that ship out the excess CO2 byproduct. The other two ingredients are silicon powder and the aforementioned alumina. To make silicon powder, we powderize silicon ingots. Yes, it's just that easy. I made the mistake last time of assuming that I didn't need much glass because it was only used in one science, while neglecting to realize that it was used a lot in that one science, so not this time. We're giving glass its own dedicated block. We throw all three of those ingredients into these powder mixers and use them to create glass mixture. We're gonna need a good number of these because the recipe is quite slow. I'm becoming quite fond of being able to put all the inserters in the same lane as the belts. Those go straight into induction furnaces to make molten glass, and while we could make glass with just that, there's also a more efficient way to cast molten glass as well. It needs a lot of nitrogen though, and that means some more of these bulky air filters. Luckily you only need a few chemical plants to process it. Then there's also those other induction furnaces, and that's because it actually takes molten tin to make, but it spits out the same amount in tin ingots along with the glass, so all we need to do is remelt it. Fitting three different fluids into these tiny casting machines is a bit awkward though. We can also use the molten glass and some strand casters to make glass fibers. They're only used in one recipe, but it's an important recipe, seeing as it's necessary to make the boards for processing units, so we definitely want some of those. Start the process with some tin ingots, and it's good to go. Okay, here's another thing I want to knock out. We've got hydro plants, you know the deal. Wastewater recycling is nice, but you'll always need a proper source of acid, and nitric acid starts by making nitrogen monoxide from ammonia and oxygen along with some green catalysts. That means combining aluminum and silver ore with an empty frame, and it's always annoying. That goes on to combine with oxygen again to create nitrogen dioxide, and finally combined with water to create nitric acid. There's a reason I needed all the acids up, but here's me clearing a massive swath of land just in case you forgot I had to do this every time I wanted to build something. That reason is... more ores. Don't worry, we're almost done with them. There's only three more to go. Six or seven technically, and maybe nine if you count uranium and thorium, but we're not making those this video. We're breaking into the advanced ores, starting with titanium. You might remember the rough setup I made just so I'd have enough to supply my bottomless appetite for titanium pipes, and it comes with one problem. Well, two, but first things first. That problem is that instead of two ores, it takes three different ores to make the pure stuff, so I can't just use the same design I've been using as all the other ones. It's not like I need to make everything from scratch, and I can still borrow a lot from the previous design, but it takes some effort. Which is why I'm designing most of it as ghosts here in the middle of nowhere. Since it's got more ore demand, I'm giving it two stops for sludge, but I'm still running everything through the middle of the crystallizers. It's just that it's a little wider than before. Now, not only do we need to adjust the crystallizers, but we need to redo the ore flotation as well. It's easy though, seeing as I just need to paste one lane of the existing design three times. I'm making the middle one two belts wide for symmetry reasons. The best part about this is I can fit two geode washers now, which gets me much closer to the ideal ratio of crystal seedling production. Squeezing beacons into these things is probably going to be impossible, so if I ever end up beaconing these builds, I'll probably need to pipe in supplementary seedlings from somewhere else, but that's a problem for future Dosh. I just wanted to say that this is why I really love Factorio. Even though I've been playing this mod for so long, every time I make one of these new builds, I find some way to improve upon the old one. Like with this waste water handling, which is much cleaner than the old build because all I need to do is run the particular flavor of waste between these undergrounds and plug it into the pipe it belongs in. Alright, here's the second problem. These train stops are for the acids. Yes, the acids. It's been a while, but to unlock the full potential of these ores, we need to float them and leach them, and that's done in these leaching plants and one of the four acids depending on the type of ore we're leaching. 
Half of them take sulfuric acid, but the other three take fluoric, chloric, and nitric. And since we've already got the sulfuric acid on site to process the geos to crystal slurry, we just need to bring in two other acids. The leaching setup is pretty simple compared to the floating, because it doesn't have any byproducts. There's one last thing we'll need before we can turn that into pure titanium, and that's the catalysts. First we needed mineral catalysts, and then crystal catalysts, but this time we need hybrid catalysts, which are made by combining the two. Those can go on the sides of the leaching plants, and I've got this space to fit these train stops, which can drop off any excess ore byproducts from other processes. It always pays to think ahead. And all that's left to do is throw them all into ore sorters. It's a lot of belts to fit into one machine, but these super long range inserters can handle it just fine. And there it is. Now we just turn it into a blueprint and paste it where the robots can get to it. You know what? I think this calls for a musical interlude. Okay, we've got titanium ore, and this is really painful, but I can't actually make the tier 3 smelting for titanium. That requires yellow science, which I'm still very far from getting, so we'll need to settle with only using processed titanium. Though looking at the tier 3 recipe, it looks like a massive headache, so maybe this is for the best. The first step requires some carbon. Unfortunately, since this build is much wider than the others, I can't just reuse my carbon off rails blueprint, but I guess it does mean I can fit more. Then we'll just need to get some of that chlorine gas we made ages ago and pump it into a bunch of chemical furnaces to get out our finished titanium tetrachloride. That feeds into another set of chemical furnaces to become titanium sponges. Again, I'm planning these ratios of manufacturers out using hell mod beforehand. That goes into blast furnaces fueled by the carbon and that becomes our ingots. This train collects our ingots to be sent off to stuff like night and all, but these other stops are a bit more esoteric. They're for something called manganese, which seems to be more of a nuisance than anything, but it's something I'll eventually need to deal with, and it can be used similar to the molten steel recipe to cut the amount of titanium ingots required to make molten titanium. So I'm setting the induction furnaces up to accept two inputs ahead of time. And thanks to this build's incredible thickness, I'm gonna need to redesign the casting machine setup as well. But it's pretty much the same, and I'm sure you all get the idea by now. Ah, titanium. Sadly, we can't actually research the recipe that allows us to make titanium sheets using coolant, but we can design coolant ahead of time. Again, fitting it into the wider space. I think this design looks much better than the previous one, though. I'm just going to appreciate this thing a bit more. Seriously, this is one of the most aesthetic things I've ever built. If only I didn't get the order of the red, white, and blue ores wrong. But, uh, this one goes out to all my Serbian fans, I guess. You want to know the best thing about building this whole thing? It means I don't need to build it again! Yeah, so we're after gold this time. And don't forget how massive these things are. These leaching plants and ore sorters are especially expensive and take forever for the old base to make. Once again, we're limited to the tier 2 recipe, which is just as well because you remember how much I hated silver? Well, gold's tier 3 recipe is pretty much the same, but even worse. The tier 2 recipe, however, is very convenient. It starts with this chloroauric acid made from gold ingots, nitric acid, and hydrochloric acid in a chemical plant. The nitric acid is used in the ore leaching of rubite, whereas the chloric isn't, but fortunately the other two leaching recipes take sulfuric, so we've got a train stop free to fit in the hydrochloric anyway. That moves on to some chemical furnaces to make gold cathodes. I'm sorry, did I say some? I meant a staggering amount of chemical furnaces. We're going to need to make 48 of these things to meet the throughput demands. And despite all the little tweaks I've been doing to the old base to squeeze out as much production as possible that didn't quite make the cut to video, it's still crying bloody tears after all this. Well, it's better than dealing with sodium cyanide again. Anyway, the chloroauric acid combines with the processed gold and moves on to the next step. We'll be turning these into ingots and borrowing the fuel from the titanium build. But remember, we'll need to route some of the finished product back into the start to feed the chemical plants. But you're smart, I'm sure you can guess how we're gonna manage that already. Now, gold ingots aren't actually used in anything, so no need to put them on trains. But what we will need is another train carrying molten copper. Because like tin and silver before it, we can make the very powerful gold wire coils. You've seen this a million times before, yada yada, another coolant build we can't use, and we're ready to turn this baby on. You know what, let's watch this thing spin up from the start. I think this might as well be considered pornography. At least it is to me. I'm sure some German out there will be lamenting their sudden and unexpected dry cleaning bill after this.
there's one ore left, but I've got to give my base enough time to build all the manufactories I'll need. In the meantime, I'm about to embark on a dramatic shift from the grind for ores, starting with all these washing plants. I'm sure you know what these do by now, and that means we're making mud, as well as sand. We're back to farming, but this time we're making a new crop, something called Prime Dedalion. Just like the Benefran, it's a desert crop and takes sand and salt water, but we're not after the finished crop per se, so much as we're after the compost. It's just one of the easiest things we can make to continuously throw into a composter. I totally messed up and forgot to leave space for the output of these farms, seeing as I'm running the mud through, so it's time for some cursed belt weaving. That gets turned into seeds, then composted, and we'll combine the compost with the mud to create soil. This whole thing ended up being massively complicated and was basically a gigantic waste of my time because all I wanted to do was put some soil on a train just in case I ever needed it or some compost in small amounts somewhere else, but it always ended up being easier to make it on site. Anyway, we liquefy and clarify any excess mud that makes it to the end because we want the farms and composters to continually run and if I didn't this whole thing would get clogged up with mud when soil production was fully saturated. Honestly, I should have just done without the soil production, but we've already built it, so whatever. The real reason for this block was to make fertilizer. Unlike soil and compost, fertilizer is very convenient to ship elsewhere. It requires some urea gas, which is made from ammonia and oxygen. We don't need too much of it, and we combine that with some of the compost to make the finished fertilizer. Even with all these farms making compost, we can't make that much, but it's used in very small amounts, so it balances out. Also, for some reason it stacks to 500, so loading a train with this stuff is gonna take forever. Since we have the Prime Dead Lion, we might as well process it. It's not the main point of this build, but if they're not getting turned into compost, then they might as well go through here to be turned into corn. Corn is special because we can put it into a liquefier along with some water to ferment it. That fermented liquid can then go into another liquefier to either become acetic acid or ethanol gas. It also spits out some compost, which we'll just route back into the fertilizer with priority. I don't have anything in mind right now, but it's always good to have these things available. Well, I forgot to press record again, but the good news is you've already seen this before. We're going to finish off all the ore processing we'll need to get all but the yellow and space science. Cobalt is like zinc and nickel, such that it's only used in alloys, so it's pretty quick. The second tier requires limestone, so here's some more washing plants. This time I'm actually getting rid of the mud instead of turning it into landfill and leaving it in a box. But don't ask me how long it took me to realize that the reason it was clogging with mud was because I put an overflow valve in front of the seafloor pump instead of a top-up valve. All that limestone can go straight into a bunch of chemical furnaces to combine with the processed cobalt to become cobalt oxide. This stuff's actually used to make lithium-ion batteries as well. Another thing for next video, but good to know I've already got them covered. Then we'll need some more carbon, but would you look at that, we've already got a blueprint for it. Throw them in some furnaces, and we've got our cobalt ingots. Seriously, there's just something mesmerizing about watching all these colors drift along. With these cobalt ingots, we can actually finish up all our alloys, like the steel sheets and the cobalt steel plates. Alright, I haven't been mentioning it until now, but I've never had a reliable source of agricultural science, because it can only come from the gardens I scavenge from some of the islands. This crappy build from the first starter base is still supplying me with all my plant science, and that's a problem because we're about to start our own agricultural revolution. The plant samples we need can only come from processing the gardens we find, except we can actually make our own gardens. It's just a massive pain. That fertilizer was incredibly important for starting this because we need to make alienated fertilizer by combining it with alien goo, which comes from the alien bacteria we made for that module build a million years ago. These are farms specialized for growing desert environment crops. They're twice as fast and would be great for growing beans, but the problem is they also take the precious few plant samples we can scavenge, so I haven't been able to automate them. If we put a garden in one of these farms along with some alien fertilizer, mineral water, and 30 plant samples, we'll be able to create a new garden. Here's the catch. We need to use that garden to make more plant samples. If we process that, we'll get 32 plant samples for a net gain of 2 after we feed them back into the farm. The only problem is, it takes 500 seconds to process one garden. That means that if we want to actually create an extra garden, we'll need to process the same garden 15 times, or for 2 hours. However, this process isn't single-threaded, and once we have more gardens, we can process them simultaneously, creating more gardens even faster. And you'll realize that it becomes quite exponential. It just takes forever for it to get going. Here's some more fish to make the alien bacteria. This design sucks, but it's a good thing I can figure that out while it's still small scale. Yeah, so it's going to be a long time before this thing is spitting out excess plant samples, because while I could use the extra garden all at once, it's much better to let it build up exponentially first before trying to extract anything. 
I hate this thing. I hated it so much I opened up editor mode just so I didn't need to walk all the way over there just to rip them out of the machine and distribute it intelligently. And I feel no shame about telling you that. I really should have designed it better, but I totally underestimated just how long this thing takes. I added beacons later and it was still glacial. Anyway, let's think about something else while that runs in the background. I've got all the metals I'll need, but there's a couple other things we've got left to sort out. Remember last video when I complained about making plastic and resin, and this video when I showed you that petrochemical disaster that is rubber? Well, there's other ways to make them, specifically from plants. We've got more washing plants, and that means we're after mud again. A lot of mud, because we're growing another temperate crop. Unfortunately, that means dealing with soil again, but I'm making it a bit wider than I did with the previous build. I'm also leaving enough space for beacons this time, because I'm getting more and more familiar with how these things work, and I know for a fact I'm gonna need a lot of this stuff. Yeah, we're growing Tianaton again. So much, in fact, that I decided to double the number of washing plants because I realized I should build it assuming for the advanced farms with twice the crafting speed, since we'll have those automated just as soon as the thing we just built runs for another 50 hours. To kick the process off, I throw in some seeds and soil I scavenged from the charcoal build, and there it goes. If you'll recall, processing Tianaton produces cellulose, and not only can it make charcoal, but it can also be thrown into liquefiers to create methanol. The crafting time is quite long, so we'll need a lot of these. The methanol gas isn't what we're after, however, and we're gonna need to process it further in these steam crackers. We'll need steam for the steam crackers, so here's some more electric boilers. Using these, we can crack the methanol down to propene gas and residual gas. There seem to be some minor recipes that take these three fluids, and the residual gas in particular is useful, so we'll just put them on trains. But what we're really after is turning that propene gas into liquid plastic. There's much more advanced ways to make plastics, but this one's the most straightforward. And best of all, no catalysts or multi-step fluid nightmares. It's funny to see this massive build supporting only a handful of plastic assemblers, but there it is. Can you feel it? We're almost to the final hurdle. Not quite, though. It's been four hours, let's check in on the gardens. Yep, still gardening. We've got plastic, and now we'll need resin. I'm building it in this block here. I'm also going to need some sand again, so that means more washing plants. We're going to need to ship in fertilizer and carbon dioxide, but I'm surprised I managed to make this thing so compact. You may have noticed the arboretums, and that's because we're going to be growing trees. We need some tree seed generators, and we'll also need soil. Thankfully there's a recipe to make soil using sand instead of mud, because we would have needed a million washing plants to supply this with all the mud we'll need. The only catch is we'll need two composts instead of one, but considering the amount of wood we're going to get out of this, we'll have plenty to compost. To actually make the trees, we'll need soil, fertilizer, water, and some tree seeds. But not just any tree seeds, temperate tree seeds, because we're growing special trees. Specifically, trees that will spit out a bunch of raw bioresin. But first, we need to actually make the seeds. They take the same ingredients as the trees themselves, except with some CO2 instead of seeds. But let me tell you, these tree seed generators are the biggest problem, because once again, they can only be made from a large number of plant samples, which are still a long ways away from producing any excess. It's always satisfying when you finish a repeatable design and get to copy it a bunch of times. So once we have the bioresin, we need to turn it to liquid resin in a liquefier, but we'll also need some of that ethanol we got from the corn a while back. But it doesn't just spit out bioresin, it also makes trees, which we can turn into wood. We've done this before, but it's a lot more convenient now that we have requester chests to bring in the saw blades, since they're only consumed 5% of the time and can be continuously reused by throwing them back into the chest. Most of the wood will be routed back to the start to feed the composters, but the rest can also be turned into resin at a processing plant. If we wanted simplicity, we could have just grown trees without the bioresin and made it purely from wood, but this way makes a lot more resin. We just need a good source of ethanol. For some reason I started turning the solid resin into liquid resin too, thinking I'd only ship out liquid resin since it's easy to turn into resin on site, but it's quite the waste of ethanol and I changed it later. This whole thing is probably due for a redesign once I'll need to expand it, but it's good for now. Time to turn this thing on. Hopefully when you see stuff actually moving on them, you can understand how this mess of belts works. To actually make the tree seed generators, I need to grow temperate trees. They take 16 plant samples and have a 50% chance to just grow nothing at all. Then that'll get me one tree seed generator. At least I started the garden processing 7 hours ago, so we can actually spare some now. That's our resin farm. It had its own challenges, and I'll definitely need to add some real ethanol production, but I still prefer it to the petrochemical recipe. Plus, at this point, after the beans, I feel like I'm committed to farming as many things as possible. 
Alright, that's one massive tree farm. Let's make another. This one's gonna be a bit more complex, though, at least at the start. We're making a ton of sand again, and that's because we're going to be farming more Beanafran. Good old reliable Beanafran. I'm definitely getting the hang of designing these farms, because now they're compact and can fit beacons. We don't need too many farms, but you might be wondering what Beanafran's got to do with tree farming. Well, we can use it to make the compost for the soil we'll need, but we could have just done that with the wood, even if it would cut into our yields. What we actually need it for is the same thing that's powering our whole base, the nutrient pulp. We just process it and throw the beans into a nutrient extractor. After that, we'll actually make the soil, once again using the sand recipe since we've got tons of compost available. With our soil and pulp ready, we can actually start growing the trees. These aren't special trees or anything, they're just normal trees, but they still take a bunch of these accursed tree seed generators. Actually fitting everything cleanly into these builds is pretty rough, but I make it work. Specifically, I've got an inserter that just picks up fertilizer from one belt and puts it onto another, since we barely need any, unlike the last one where I made a massive mess of splitters. The adjustable inserters are extremely useful for these kind of cramped builds, especially because I can control which side of the belt it drops it on. Now we just need to fit in the water and the nutrient pulp the arboretums will need. Then all we're waiting on are those seed generators. The garden processing is approaching something useful after 10 hours, but it's still horrible. Again, we'll be turning those trees into wood with requester chests full of saw blades, but this time we're turning them into wooden boards. I may have overbuilt this just a bit, but it doesn't hurt, because these wooden boards are the basis of all circuit production. We'll just put those on trains, and that's another piece of the puzzle solved. So this one isn't strictly something I'll need for this video, but it'll be nice to stop worrying about it. We can actually use the exact same design as we made for the wooden boards build, and just tweak it a bit near the end. We won't be turning this Beanafran into compost, but we'll still be turning it into a bunch of nutrient pulp. Normally we'd process this stuff into fuel oil, but we can also do some biomass refining in these gas refineries. If we do that, it'll spit out ethanol, butane, and acetone. The acetone is what we're after, but the ethanol is a nice bonus. As far as I can tell, the butane is totally worthless since we're making all of our plastic from plants and that's where it would have ordinarily been used, so I'm just venting it. This thing ended up being a really nice fit into this space, and it went up pretty fast too, seeing as I could just reuse most of the design. Now to use it, and shoutouts to this beautiful junction. Just like we made resin from trees, we can also make rubber. Once again, I can piece together a lot of this build from previous builds. I'll need to make an extra nitrogen source though, since instead of CO2, making desert tree seeds requires nitrogen. The arboretum designed from the wooden boards will work, but I can make it even more compact since these don't take nutrient pulp and there's no need for that extra pipe. Copy-paste that until I'm satisfied, and that'll cover the desert trees. I'd like to think that all these arboretums will counteract all the toxins I've been spewing into the atmosphere. We'll bring in the fertilizer by train, as well as the acetone we just made. Just like the resin, that goes into some liquefiers along with the fluid to become liquid rubber. The liquid rubber goes into assemblers to become rubber, and that's used in like one recipe to make a foot for the spider tron, so we're going to want to immediately turn that into insulated wire, which is used for many things, and most notably modules. That takes some tinned wire, but we can bring in our wire coil train, drop the coils on the belt, and have it instantly turned into tinned cable. Sure beats needing to bring in both tin and copper, and needing two assemblers. There's one complication, these things also produce trees that we'll need to deal with. These desert trees don't take soil at all, so there's nothing to gain from composting them, and we're making rubber here, not resin. We'll still turn them to wood with these assemblers, and while that's not the main purpose of this build, it's always nice to have more resin, so we'll route the majority of it into some bioprocessors and put that onto another train. However, that means that this thing could back up if the resin belt is full, and we want this thing to make rubber even if we don't need resin. Thanks to a funny little quirk I noticed, we can get rid of all the excess wood with composters. One wood turns to one compost, which you'd think would also clog up eventually, but we can compost compost. Five compost turns to one compost, and if we just keep swapping compost between two composters, we can effectively delete it from the game. It doesn't make much sense, but it sure is convenient. Now there's only one thing we're missing, but we need some iron ore first. It's a bit weird, but I retrofit in a train station into the first four ore builds, because when I was first building them, I forgot that I'll need a place to dump the ore byproducts from the other processes. For now, though, I'll need to use them to pick up some ore instead, and that's because one of the things we're missing is ferric chloride. And cupric chloride, but that's mostly useless in comparison. I'll still make it, though. This empty spot below the waste washing is perfect. 
All we'll need to do is bring in the ores and throw them into some liquefiers. The actual demand of this process is pretty small, and where it's needed, it's only used in trace amounts, so this small build is enough. Those ores plus some hydrogen chloride will make our desired ferric chloride solution. Again, I'll eventually run this off of the ore byproducts of the other build, but this is just to get things started. Now it's finally time. You've probably guessed what the end goal of all this was, and yes, it's science, but it's also circuits. Circuits are by far the most intensive resource in this mod. Probably about 95% of everything I've made up to this point will end up in circuits, starting with basic circuits. They're basic because they only take two ingredients, copper cable and wooden boards. For almost everything related to making circuits, we'll be using these smaller and faster electronics assemblers. They're better in every way, but it does mean we'll have less area to fit inserters. You can see the superiority of the copper wire coils here especially, because I can feed all of these factories with only four wire assemblers. If I was making it with the usual recipe, it would have taken four times as many and more than one input belt of copper. This whole thing went up pretty fast, but they're not called basic circuits for nothing, and expect that to change very soon, because now we're moving on to electronic circuits. We'll need a substantial amount of carbon, and that means we'll be taking charcoal off the rails for the billionth time. After seeing the charcoal demand, I'll definitely need to up the production later. Basic circuits are used in making electronic circuits, and so while we're putting them on trains, we're just gonna run them straight into the next build instead of trying to separate them via blocks. So this is where the circuits start getting complicated. We need to make electronic components, electronic boards, and finally the electronic circuit itself. The difficulty becomes how to cleanly and effectively combine everything into one. The biggest challenge is the electronic components, and that's because they're used in massive quantities. I'm shooting for a little under 140 green circuits a second, and that's without beacons. The electronic component assemblers turn one carbon and two tinned cables into ten components, meaning it outputs three times as much as it takes in. So in a world where belts can only move so many items a second, that can become quite a problem, because that number would require 700 components a second. Even with the mod's most advanced belts, it would still take 10 lanes fully saturated with components to supply it. Because of that, it's best to insert them directly from assembler to assembler. Each one of these board assemblers needs about two component assemblers, and two of those for one circuit assembler, so this thing's almost perfectly ratioed. Since every intermediate product is being inserted directly, we just need to worry about routing the raw materials, which would be the carbon, basic circuits, solder coils, and tin coils. Again, showing their power, as we only need one assembler before every lane to meet throughput demands. This thing kind of looks like a quilt from the map view. We'll also need to bring in iron plates, but we'll do that from the other side. They need to be turned into plates from the sheets first, but they plug right in. There's our green circuits, and aren't they beautiful. But we're not done here, not by a long shot. That was like, the tutorial level. Here's where it gets serious. Advanced circuits. Here's me retrofitting a resin train into that old build. Anyway, unlike the previous two where we could just make the whole thing all at once, there's no way we could do that here. We'll still need some green circuits as ingredients, but first we need to make a bunch of advanced circuit substrates. This is what we needed that ferric chloride for. The design itself is pretty simple, but it's the logistics that's the tough part. I make it look easy, but I don't want to downplay the several minutes it took me standing around thinking about it before settling on a design, then several more minutes actually tweaking that design. And yes, by minutes I mean hours. One of the main ingredients is the phenolic board, which is a combination of wooden boards and resin. Thankfully, unlike the substrates themselves, the phenolic boards are fast to craft, so we only need a handful of assemblers. After copy-pasting it a couple times, now we need to actually think about getting everything onto the belts. The unloading of these trains is pretty cramped, but I make two belts for boards and one for resin, since the recipe needs twice as many boards, and then run those vertically through the phenolic board assemblers. Next is getting the tin plates and copper plates in there. Fortunately, I can use my compact sheet-to-plate design from the previous circuits, except I'll make one side for copper and one for tin. Then I'll need to find a way to combine them while trying to keep the throughput capabilities of the belts relatively balanced, and then shove them in. They'll share a belt, and I always love this way of using splitters to perfectly turn two belts into two mixed belts. Again, I'm sure this makes a lot more sense once you actually see it in motion, but there it is. The boards. Yeah, there's more. So now that we have the substrates, we can start attaching things to the substrates. Just like the last ones, we'll need some basic electronics, but we'll also need transistors, which have their own resource demands. 
I'm gonna keep with the theme of directly inserting everything, even though I could probably get away without it here, seeing as the Red Circuit's demand isn't as high. It's still almost the ideal ratio, but you can start to see what I mean with the number of inserters becoming a problem, since for one transistor assembler, we'll need three to put in the material and two to distribute that to the board assemblers. Multiply that across all the assemblers, and you end up with this. Again, the difficulty is in actually getting the materials to the assemblers. We'll need everything we used previously to make the electronic components, but we'll also need everything to make the transistors too. For this part alone, we're going to need to bring in six separate trains containing monosilicon, plastic, charcoal, solder, tinned wire, and silver wire. Circuits are basically the final boss of this mod, and this is just the advanced circuits. The different coils will come vertically and feed the one assembler at the beginning, which will be enough to support that entire lane. The only catch is that we need to turn monosilicon into silicon wafers, and these actually require full-sized assemblers. After working with the small ones so much, they feel gigantic. You can see how the different, I don't know, let's call them decoilers. You can see how all the decoilers are pulling from different lanes and are ready to feed into their respective lanes. If I'm making building something this complex look easy, it isn't, and you can see how long it took me just to build this part. But I can finally start calling in the trains and watching it fill up. Once I'm convinced everything is going where it should, I can start extending the lane to the desired length. It might look like this design doesn't have room for beacons, but this mod has really long-ranged beacons, and I'm confident I could fit them in through the middle. I just need to move around some inserters. That leaves the final step, actually making the circuits. Mercifully, this part is much easier than the last one. All we'll need in addition to the green circuits and advanced circuits are aluminum sheets and copper cables. It takes a lot of aluminum, so we're taking that into account by building four separate belts to carry it all. Because each sheet turns into four plates, it's a good ratio. Then I just need to sort out putting the boards and greens onto belts, but I'm not going to dwell too much on explaining that when I could just show it to you in action instead. If my gold smelting design was pornographic, then this is just downright obscene. I feel like I could just watch this thing forever. Mm, but I can't, because I've got a video to finish. I'm actually going to split processing units into a different block, and I'm giving it a separate rail from the other circuits to ease congestion a bit, seeing as we're putting like 20 stops on each lane. Just because I intentionally chose a design with limited throughput doesn't mean I'm not going to try to mitigate it. Just like the reds, we'll need to make the blue substrate first. It's very similar to the red substrate. In fact, we can just copy the red substrate build. Probably the only recipe design where that's possible. Instead of phenolic boards, however, we'll be making fiberglass boards, using liquid resin and those glass fibers from ages ago. They also need to be made in big assemblers, but apart from that, we'll just need to bring in copper sheets and silver sheets to turn them into plates using our pre-existing design. We don't need as many of these as reds, and I'm running the advanced circuits through to keep with the theme. I separated them into blocks, but if I wanted to make a new circuit block, I could just paste this in front of the advanced circuits and still have it work. Alright, this is where boys become men, and engineers become, I don't know, senior engineers. We've got to make the processing boards. You may have noticed a pattern from the last two circuits, or you actually remember when I built these in my terrible starter base two months ago. Whatever the case, now we're going to need electronic components, transistors, and integrated electronics, which includes all the stuff we needed before, and even more. The only saving grace is that as the circuits get more advanced, we need to make less of them, and we're still going to try to solve everything with direct insertion. The ratios are roughly 1 to 2 for all the components and the boards. This poses a unique challenge because the microchips require sulfuric acid. They can share the plastic and the wafers they'll need with the transistors, though. This is so complicated I had to make some temporary constant combinators just to output an image so I wouldn't lose track of which belt was going to carry what while designing it, so I've given up all hope of trying to explain it to you. Once I've gotten the repeatable design, I can start thinking about how to fill the belts. It'll basically be the same as the last one, where the decoilers pull from a vertical smorgasbord of coils. We've got our solder, tin, and silver, and this time we're adding gold wire to the mix. This is by far the most complicated part, and I'd just like to say that being able to bring in several different resources and unload them in such a cramped space is great. It may not be the best for throughput, but it's great for convenience. I can only fit three belts on one side, so for the vertical belts, three will be coming from the top and three from below. Once I've finally got that squared away, I can start extending it. And to add a little flair in this space we've got, I decide to add my favorite quote from the classic movie Spy Kids 2. Now it's time to call in the trains.
Time to make the actual processing units. It's pretty simple, even simpler than the advanced circuits, and that's because we only need one plate, and that's titanium. The fourth ingredient is some more sulfuric acid, which we can just borrow from the previous build. We just need to put the blue boards and advanced circuits on the same belt, and it's good to go. Here's another thing I've been mostly editing out, shooting a billion worms every time I want to expand somewhere. Anyway, here's the finished build. This thing is beautiful, just beautiful. This is why I decided to go for these compact builds, for your viewing pleasure. Frankly, if you got this far into a video about some dude playing Factorio for 100 hours and this doesn't inspire a stirring in your loins, you're probably the weird one. Okay, I happen to notice my power grid, and it's in pain. Turns out those electronics assemblers we've been making hundreds of have an insane power demand. No matter, we'll just paste another bean plant. It took me a while to realize it, and it'll take me even longer to get this thing up and running, but that's exactly why I added these massive tanks of fuel. You can see they've drained quite a bit, and thanks to that, I didn't end up in a power death spiral. As I said, this design could be improved with heat exchangers, but I'll leave designing the Generation 3 bean power for next video. Mark my words, I'm going to try and get bean power all the way to the end game. I make no promises, and if my game starts lagging, I'll be forced to switch to thorium or something, but I'm all in on beans. Anyway, we've got all the circuits, and now we've got most everything we'll need to make all the science. At least up to purple and pink. Yes, this entire video was about rebuilding that crappy old base, but scalable to the point of making millions of science. Seriously, I don't think you fully conceptualize how much a million science is, especially when the science is ten times harder to make. 100 SPM is a decently sized base, and that would still take us 170 hours just to finish the final research. I know we've been playing longer than that, but I don't want to AFK for seven days just to win. Regardless, we're down here making science. After being surrounded by such a massive base for so long, being in this open area is giving me a strange sense of agoraphobia. Don't worry, it's only empty for now. Eventually the science will be flanked on all sides by industry just like the rest of the base. Next video. That's red science. It's so basic it hardly warrants mention. It's just iron and copper. Green science, however, is a little bit more complicated. I know I usually use that as an understatement, but it actually is just a little bit more complicated. Unlike pretty much everything else in this run, here we're more concerned with taking things off trains than putting them on. I know I'll need six different resources to make green science, so I make six rather cramped stations. I could have borrowed the iron and copper from the red science, but I feel like that violates the modular nature of this base, even if it's unlikely I'll ever need to build another science block. These cramped decoilers don't have the best throughput, but compared to the other sciences, green takes next to nothing of each. The actual components to make green science are a bit odd, with this multi-step process between electronics assemblers to make these weird micro-wafers and stuff. Each step just takes one additional ingredient, and it's a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. This thing also spits out a million micro-circuits a second, so direct insertion is the way to go. Those make Atmos instrumentation, and we move on to the other half. I'm sorry, but we need to break our symmetry here. I know, I know, but for a base this size, the science builds are still pretty small in comparison. We'll just need some iron and some tinned cable to make the Atmos reaction nodes. It might not look like much, but this is just enough to make around 400 SPM. And that's without modules. We just combine those, and we've got our single-use Atmos sets. Yes, there's a reason I've been calling it Green Science, and we'll continue to do so. By the way, the Red Science is called Sacrificial Electromagnet. So we're flying high, we're on cloud nine, we've just knocked out two of the five sciences we're gonna build in a little over an hour, but now we've got to contend with blue science. The difference in complexity is immense, but instead of standing around and getting overwhelmed, we can ease into it. As soon as we build the stations for all the resources, it'll be much less intimidating, and so I'm building for the multitude of metals we'll need and decoiling them into plates. Unlike the green science, we're actually going to need some decent throughput to supply this thing, so we're using a similar unloading design like we use for the circuits, and then turning those into two belts worth of plates. Copper is used so much here, I've got two trains dedicated to it. So the first thing I decided to make is chemical laser flash fuel. It takes fuel oil and naphtha. Yeah, remember when we made that a million years ago? Well, it's time to actually use it. Also, it takes some steel plates, but after realizing that I need to route four different materials past it, I decided to rip everything up and move it before the decoilers. It's harder for you to visualize what's going on when there's nothing on the belts, but being able to suddenly rearrange things is exactly why I don't fill these up until the design is finished. It's also the only thing that takes steel, so I don't need to worry about routing that anymore. 
We'll also need to bring in green circuits and red circuits, so we set up some stops for those. Now this is the complicated part. We've got to make four different components, but thankfully they all have the same crafting speeds and are used in the same amounts, so we can use the same number of assemblers for all of them. But would you look at that? I've got the same image I used last time I tried to explain them. But of course I didn't go as in-depth then. Yeah, so not only do these all take several items each, as well as some nitrogen, it's got a waste byproduct too. Lovely. Well, as long as we set up the assemblers to have the number of belts and inserters they'll need, we'll be one step closer. But again, most of the difficulty is in actually routing the items where they're needed. They all need pretty much everything, except the atomic sensor array doesn't take glass, so we can just run that straight down the middle. Now we've got everything set up with the inserters ready to insert, but we'll still need some nitrogen. I put it down here, but we've got to leave space for the train to take away our waste. Luckily, we don't need much nitrogen, and just this and a few chemical plants up here will cover it. To get rid of the coppery waste, we just need to break it down inside of an assembler and turn it to copper ore. Yes, these are the ore byproducts I've been talking about so much. There's way more we'll need to contend with in the future, but it's good to know I'm set up to deal with them. Since I really want to know when it happens, I'm adding an alarm for when the waste gets clogged. I'm going ahead and setting up the landing zone for the finished products. It's really easy, just inserting two items and outputting the finished science. Despite having five different items, the fuel, laser foci, and laser emitter combine to create the Femto laser array. In theory, the belt should be set up, so I start calling in the trains. We don't have enough trains at the moment, but you can see how the foci and laser emitters feed into the arrays. Ignore how it was taking coppery waste off, it was dumb and I fixed it. Thank the Factorio gods for filter splitters. That's the uni-lived atomic manipulators done. Or, you know, blue science. There's still two more. Well, we've made it this far. Can't back down now. Happy 200 hours mark, by the way. I haven't been using the time warp at all recently, so the last 120 hours have been all legit. You might be wondering why I've pasted some random Tianaton farming here. As it turns out, last time when I downloaded the wire shortcuts mod because handcrafting wires to make my mall was annoying me, I inadvertently removed red and green wires from the game. And those just so happen to be the ingredients in the next science. That's right, I accidentally cheated, and someone was kind enough to inform me last video, which I conveniently ignored until now and just let my old base continue to make purple science, but I'd never be able to live with myself if I didn't build it right. Thankfully, the mod lets you add them back to the game in the form of surrogates. As you see, we're turning limestone into lime, and that's because to make wires, we need to make paper. I just wanted to point out this train stop. I'm actually surprised it works, because the signals are misaligned, and yet it still manages to separate the rails and allow them to stop right in front of each other. I never learned these things if I played rationally all the time. Yeah, so anyway, paper making is weird. We'll need some cellulose, hence the Tianaton farming, but we'll also need something called white liquor to turn it into pulp and then paper. We'll need some sodium sulfate, something we were happy to dispose of until now, which is made from acid and sodium hydroxide from the saltwater electrolysis. But that doesn't take any lime. So what happens is, when we use the white liquor to make pulp, it turns into black liquor, and that needs to be cleaned into green liquor and finally turned back into white liquor with some lime and water. It loses some in the process, but like the coolant, we'll only want the main supply to make more if it's below a certain limit, so there's always room for the recycled stuff. It also spits out limestone, which we can turn back into lime. From there, it's incredibly easy. We just turn the cellulose into paper. There's more complex recipes, but why would you ever use them when you could just use a recipe that takes one ingredient instead of four and is almost as good anyway? All that paper goes down, and we bring in some more tinned wire to finally combine them with our paper to make the surrogate wires. They're not quite green and red, but I kind of like them. We'll just load them up on our kissing stations and move on. There's one more thing I'm missing. It's pretty minor. It's methane gas, and it takes those hitherto neglected natural gas liquids we get from oil refining. We'd have more uses for it if it weren't for all the bio stuff, but here it's pretty much only useful for methane, and I like it that way. We'll need some synthesis gas, which is easy considering the massive amounts of residual gas or plastic build pumps out. But can I just stop talking about this and show you what it looks like? I mean, it makes methane gas and vents the rest. That's all it does. Purple science. Yeah, it's really intimidating, but just like last time, I calmly start setting up all the train stops I'll need. And this time I can even borrow the decoiling design. The fluids are in the back because they're the easiest to route with the massive 25 length underground pipes. The protective chip enclosures I make first, not just because they're small and could fit in this space, but because they use two ingredients that aren't used in anything else, so I don't need to worry about routing around as many belts. It also gives off some coppery waste, but we'll just throw that onto another train just like last time. 
Okay, next step. Water-cooled overclocked neural computer case. Yeah, so it takes a bunch of the plates we made as well as those chip enclosures. Its one quirk is that it takes in sulfur dioxide and spits out sulfur as a byproduct. More sulfur's worth in dioxide than it takes in, actually, and to turn that back into sulfur dioxide, we'll need to bring in some oxygen. We don't care about the excess, so it gets vented into the atmosphere to keep the belts from getting clogged with sulfur. I'm starting to feel my brain leaking out of my ears. I'm getting some kind of Gestaltzer fall phenomenon. They don't look like items anymore, I'm just moving colors around. Well, I'm sure it's fine. We've got to make biosilicate extract, which is pretty easy, all things considered, because we just need to throw steel, silicon, plastic, and green circuits into a chemical plant along with some methane, then toss that into a furnace to get activated biopaste. Last thing, these QL bioprocessors. They take our biopaste, a processing unit, and some of our surrogate red wires. I hope it doesn't feel like I'm rushing things here, it's more that I've just run out of interesting things to say. But for this one, it has another waste byproduct we've got to contend with. I'll put it on the lower belt with filter inserters, but this one's not like the copper waste because it makes iron ore and copper ore when you break it down, so we'll need two waste trains. Just like all the others, we throw those two things into a bunch of assemblers and collect our science. The Burns Out QL Bioprocessor. Well, that was a lot of work for one science. It's almost as tall as the previous three combined. Hopefully we've got room for the last one, pink science. Once again, setting up all the trains, but what an incredible confluence of locomotives. Prepare yourself. This thing takes sulfuric acid, lubricant, processing units, aluminum, brass, advanced circuits, silicon, gold wire, cobalt steel, plastic, titanium, and solder. It looks simple, and maybe it would be if I wasn't trying to cram it in such a tight space, but it's a nightmare of belts. The main problem is I need to make titanium gears and cobalt steel ball bearings for one half, and a cobalt steel gears and titanium ball bearings for the other half of the flying machine. I don't want to talk about this thing, I don't even want to look at it. Ew, get it away from me. At least it doesn't make waste byproducts. It took so much trial and error to get the belts right, and then I still needed to make the combined memory cells. So many of the items I needed are just for the integrated electronics I needed. Maybe I should have shoved them onto their own train somewhere. Somehow, I managed to fit it all in here. And I'd just like to point out that I forgot that I need to turn the titanium sheets into plates before I could use them, and I had to make a stop in this lacuna of industry to turn them into plates and then put them on a special train. But it works. Finally, we get to throw them all into the science assemblers, and we've got our commercial AI implementation. I can't believe it. I can't believe we're finally here. Over 120 hours to intelligently remake all the sciences we threw together in 80. But looking at all this, it was worth it. Even if they're a lot more effort, I love making these kind of disciplined spaghetti bases, and I hope you enjoy looking at them. I'm just not going to think about the last two sciences I'll need to make as I start to make a relationship final with my new base as I move in our labs. I did set up the sciences to be put on trains, but I'm going to save building the science stop for when I've actually got all the science. For now, I'm just going to stuff all of our labs in this little interstice between the sciences and use provider chests to bring in all the flavors of science with requester chests. Again, I'm not rebuilding military or plant sciences in the real base, but I'm still going to put them on belts. I should mention that this base isn't capable of maintaining the roughly 400 SPM modulus that I built for, but that's why I designed the base the way I did. Plastic and resin especially are going to need a boost, and most of the major metals too, as well as a massive increase to sludge production, but that's something that's great for next video. Oh man, I did not think it was going to take this long to rebuild the sciences. But just look at what we've accomplished here. I said it before, but it almost feels unreal to look at all this stuff and remember that at some point in time I actually built all this stuff piece by piece. I know we didn't make much quote unquote progress this video, but hopefully this view makes up for it. We can look at the old base and man what a difference. I know I've still got a lot of game ahead of me, but honestly, I think the worst is behind us. I think with this base at my back, those last two sciences and the ultimate goal of the FTL spaceship doesn't stand a chance. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons. Really, genuinely, and from the bottom of my heart. Because they're the only reason I can feel secure about making this kind of video, and the only reason they get made in the first place. Let me tell you, there's much more profitable uses of my time than playing a mod for 120 hours and then spending another 80 editing it all together. It really warms the furnace of my industrial heart that people love what I do enough to not only watch an hour and 40 minute long video this far, but also give me money for it. So once again, thank you. I'll see you all next time.